the uh, keep him in prayer. Um, we had a good trip. Um, I, when I, what I'm about to say, I mean, that Bible Museum in Phoenix, Arizona needs to be the Disney World of Christians. Better than the ark? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been a King James Bible guy my whole life. I've read everything I get my hands on defending the King James Bible. And they brought out things in that museum I'd never heard in my life. And right down to the very physical structure of man himself. And how God designed two Bibles in his hands. And, and every time you eat, your God is making, forcing you to confess to him that you can't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of his mouth. You have a 1611 right there in both hands. And uh, it's just, uh, it was a phenomenal experience. Gary has done a good job putting that together. He does a great job at presenting the material. You go around and click on things, and it'll be a little four-minute video, and the stuff he gets out four-minute clips is, is just mind-blowing. Uh, but if you ever get a chance to go over there and see that place, you need to go. And uh, I would promote it gladly, and, and I hope and pray that, that people get over there and get their hands on that information. Because they do a good job at, at teaching us that the, that the English Bible is the Bible of heaven. Uh, the original language was not Hebrew, it was English. And God confounded those languages and then replanted the seed of his word in Hebrew and it matured from Hebrew into Greek to Latin and then finally into its final form in English again. And we're going to see some of this stuff here tonight as we talk about this thing right here. But that's what the whole conflict of heaven and earth is about. It's about the book. Satan hates the book. That book has his judgment that book has his fate in it. And if there's one thing Satan is trying to do is it's to destroy this book. He is against the book. And you, being people of the book, are at enmity, whether you like it or not, you're at enmity with him. And he's at enmity with you. Right? Ephesians chapter 6 here. Paul says, notice this now. Notice the first word up here. If I can get this thing working. Finally, my brethren. This is the close. This is the closing instruction to the Ephesians. Now, as many of you know, I believe each of Paul's epistles represent a stage of maturity in the, in the believer's life. Amen. I believe Romans is your foundation. I believe Corinthians is a Christian stage. I believe Galatians is a Christian stage. I believe Ephesians right on down through is Christian stages of maturity. And uh, the epistles represent different stages within the individual believer's life. And Ephesians is where Paul is taking you from little children to grown men and getting you ready for conflict. He's getting you ready for the struggle. That the church has been created by God to be involved in. There is no option to this. You're on one side or the other. Amen? Yes, Let me show you something. Look over in Luke. I wasn't going to talk about this. Look at Luke chapter 2. When I say there's no middle ground in this, there's no middle ground. Luke chapter 2. Verse 34. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. You see that? Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. You know what the King James Bible is? It's the sword of the Lord exposing the hearts of men. And it's dividing. Christ said he ain't come to bring peace, he come to bring a sword. To set father against, father against son and mother against daughter. 
This book is a sword that's cutting the earth right down the middle. And men are on one side or the other of it. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing even, piercing even to the dividing asunder of spirit and soul and joint and marrow, and is the cerner of the intents and thoughts of the heart. Every man that ever comes face with face to face with this book, his heart's being discerned. Amen. And you are in the conflict. You're on one side of the conflict or the other. You're either with the book and against these powers that Paul's talking about, or you're with them and against the book. There's no middle ground. It ain't about church. It ain't about religion. You're either with this book or you're not. When I say the book, I'm talking about the King James Bible. Now Paul says here, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against all the wiles of the devil. Now this is a, this is a stage of maturity in the believer's life. And so Paul's epistles not only represent like stages that we go through individually, but it also represents stages in the maturity of the body of Christ as a whole. Amen. As we mature in the spirit, we are growing up into the head of the body and in unity with its members. Babies are divided. Spiritual people are united. Amen? And so not only as we grow up through these various stages of our Christian development, as we grow up, we're being brought into a more perfect unity as one body in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the individual perfecting of the, of, the, of the saints is for the edification and maturity of the body as a whole. And what you have to understand is this, you, this new man that you're being brought into with the other members of the body is being created by God to engage in conflict against his enemies. That's why Paul closes out the big boy epistle with get the armor on. Because this new man wrestles. Amen? You don't believe it? Look at verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against. Now we're going to get to that, what that wrestling is. But I say, what I'm about to say, I say without apology now. And I mean it. I don't care, man. I, I, I'm not going to hide it. People can get mad. They can get upset about it. What I'm about to say, I say without apology that Paul's doctrine is 100% a curriculum for the maturing of God's children. Amen. And it's for the individual perfecting of the members for the edification and the growth and maturing of the body of God's Son. And that church is being created for a purpose. Amen? So what am I saying? I'm saying these epistles represent various stages in your Christian growth. And those epistles represent a curriculum designed to mature the children of God into the perfection that is in Jesus Christ. That we can fulfill the purpose for which we are created. Amen? And here in Ephesians 6.10, you have the final instruction of this Ephesian epistle. Finally, my brethren, be what? Strong. Not tossed to and fro. That's right. Not weak. Amen. Amen? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? Stand, Stand what? Stand against. against. We are against something. Amen? This instruction here concerns our con the conflict of the new man and our preparation for warfare. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2, 10, 4, the weapons of our warfare. Okay. You know how many references there are to warfare in Paul's epistles? No man goeth the war at any, at any time in his own charges. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Fight the good fight of faith. 
You know how many charges there are concerning warfare for the body of Christ in the Pauline epistles? And all I see anymore is a bunch of money raising Girl Scouts in the church. There are no men of faith ready to fight the war. Amen? And by the way, the warfare is not arguing factions and points on Facebook. We're going to see what the wrestling is. It's when we take on the conversation of the new man that we become engaged in activity that's running contrary to the world. The world's operating according to the prince of the power of the air. We're operating according to the head of the new creature, the, G the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And that, those, those steps and that conversation sets us against the course of this world. But see, being baptized in the Christ and becoming a member of his body and becoming a part of this new man, you are now at enmity with the serpent and a part of the conflict that goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Guess who put the enmity there? God. God made the enmity. And when he puts you in his son, you become a part of that man. You become a part of that seed. You are the multiplied seed of the Lord Jesus Christ and God has put enmity between you and the children of the devil. God created the enmity. God ain't asking you to get along with the world and get along with everybody. He's asking you to stand against it. Amen. Amen. It is the work of God. He put us in enmity with the serpent and God is growing and maturing us in Christ for his purpose of reconciling and putting down his enemies. Amen. You don't believe it. You know what Paul said at the end of Romans? God bruised Satan under your feet shortly. You know why you've been created? You've been created by God to bruise Satan under your feet. That's what the body of Christ is for. Now I want you to notice verse 11 there. Stand against. You see it? Look down at verse 13. What's he say there? May be able to withstand in the evil day. Withstand. Right? You are actively standing against the wiles of the devil and asking to withstand the evil, in the evil day. You know what that means? You're pushing and they're pushing back. It's active engagement. Explained in verse 12 is wrestling. You ever seen wrestling? Yes. Where they, always start, they always start right here and they link up, don't they? And then there's a struggle to get the upper hand. Amen? Active engagement, guys actively pushing and standing against the wiles of the devil and withstanding his pushback. Now you know what you're going to need for that? You're going to need the power of the Lord. Because you can't wrestle against him in your own power. No way. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Take unto yourselves the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against all the wiles of the devil. God has asked us to stand against and withstand the pushback. Stand therefore. Quit giving up ground. When somebody comes around and says, oh, I don't agree with that. Well, sorry about your luck, buddy. We're not taking steps back. Christians in America have been giving up ground for over a hundred years. Here's my Bible. Here's eternal security. Here's redemption and justification and Good. Just been giving up ground, backing up, backing up, backing up. Preach, Need somebody to stand. Yeah. Quit being spoiled by the enemy. Amen? Yeah. Need somebody to stand against this stuff. When you stand against them, you better believe the pushback is going to come and you're going to be in a real struggle against spiritual wickedness in high places. You better believe it. Amen? If there's no active struggle in your life, it's because you're not engaged. Amen? You're not going to get a whole lot of pushback if you're going to the movies. 
You ain't going to get a whole lot of pushback at the football stadiums. You're going to be in a, you're going to be getting pushed back when you begin to walk in the conversation of the new man. Look at what he says over here in Numbers 32. Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, shall your brethren go to war and shall ye sit here? Y'all hear that verse? Gad, you see what happened is Gad and Reuben got their inheritance on the other side of Jordan. They went to Moses and said, this field is green, man. We got a lot of cattle and our cattle can eat here. If it be pleasing unto thee, just let us have this part and make us not go over Jordan. Moses' response is, shall your brethren go to war and shall ye sit here? <laughs> hey, Amen. You know, some of the brethren think it's perfectly fine to sit by while their brethren go to war. Some of the brethren think it's perfectly fine for somebody else to do all the studying, for somebody else to do all the evangelism, all the visiting of the sick, all the giving, all the mercy showing. They think it's perfectly fine for their brethren to go to war while they sit idle. Amen? Ephesians is not about a bunch of individuals. Ephesians about a bunch of individuals that's been brought into unity in one body. Amen? This work of the Lord is not one man's job. One man can't struggle against the princes of this world by themselves. Amen? And so a lot of the brethren think it's perfectly okay to have their conversation in the earth while their brethren take on the business of heaven. Amen. And this point that I'm making is wrought out in the first thing we are told to put on in Ephesians. Because you're, before you're ever told to put on, you know what a lot of people do with this passage? That's an easy Sunday sermon. Well, I don't have anything to preach, but the armor of God, six quick points I can come up with. It's just lazy, easy sermonettes. To have something to say and just fill the space with a bunch of vain babbling on Sunday. You were told to put on two things in Ephesians. That one's finally, my brethren. Before you ever get to there, you were told to put on the new man. Amen. The old man is not engaged in the wrestling. The old man's engaged in the former conversation. Right? When Paul says put on the new man here, he's not talking about some imaginative uh, positional truth. Amen? Well, I'm in Christ, and uh, Christ is in me. Is he? Is he? Just some, just some imagination, but because I, I think so. Paul ain't talking about some positional truth here. If you read Ephesians 4.22, he tells you exactly what he's talking about. That you put off concerning the former what? Conversation. conversation. He's saying put off the former conversation of the old man. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the what? New. new man. What's he mean by putting on the new man? He's saying that you put on the conversation of the new man. Who? Where's our conversation at? There it is. You take on the conversation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are to put off the former conversation that was in the earth, which is in the course of this world, the lust and the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and put on the new man whose conversation is in heaven. And like I've already said, some of the brethren think it's perfectly okay to sit at home and never read their Bibles. Come here and let somebody spoon feed them all day and then get upset when it goes over their head. Amen? God loves those who want to know Him. 
He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. That King James Bible, whether you ever pick it up or not, is the sun in your heart every day that you walk by it. Oh yeah, we'll just, just print and cut, boys. If you think that book ain't reading you every day, you walk by it and don't pick it up. It is. Then wonder why we can't get together and get anything accomplished for Jesus Christ. Amen. Some of the brethren hoard their money and won't give nothing to the ministry. Some of the brethren think it's perfectly fine for men to go to war at their own charge. Some of the brethren think it's perfectly fine to never teach, never evangelize, never do anything. Set on my lazy rump until Jesus comes. Amen, brother. But boy, let something in the world peek its head and see how quick they'll get involved. Tell them you're going to have food downstairs. Tell them we're going to go knock on doors and then tell them we're going to have food downstairs and see which one they show up for. Amen. I've watched this stuff my whole life. Their, converse, their God is their belly. They mind earthly things. Their glory is in their shame. And then somebody like me gets, gets labeled a, a whatever label they want to put on me. My conversation is in heaven. I've tried to put off as much of that former conversation as I can. It still rears its ugly head. But I know God didn't put me in Jesus Christ to continue walking the way I walked in time past. He put me in Christ to walk contrary to this thing. And the more I learn to walk like him, the more I become actively engaged in the struggle Amen, with the prince of this world and the spiritual wickedness that is in high places. Good. Amen? Yeah. This new conversation that Paul tells us to take on is in righteousness and in true holiness and is at enmity and against the course of this world and wrestles against the structure of Ephesians 6.12. The body of Christ has been created to actively engage in that heavenly realm where Satan and his princes and powers and rulers are. Amen. Therefore, this new man, because of what he's been called to do, must take on the power and armor of God. Amen. Because it's not a question of do we have to engage? If you're going to walk the way God tells you to walk, you're already engaged. Amen? If you're out there preaching the gospel, you're already engaged. Amen? If you're actively doing what God tells you to do, teaching the Bible, you think, listen man, you think Satan's worried about who the next president's going to be? He's been knocking bums like that out left and right for 2,000 years. You know, you know who Satan despises and who he's against? Men who got that book in their hand and in their heart know how to live it and preach it. That's it. Amen? You better believe it. This new conversation God wants us to take on is the conversation of the new man that is in heaven. And this new man is put on, how? Being renewed in the spirit of your what? How does that renewing take place? For the which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is what? You know what that is? That's maturity. That is an inward day by day growing and maturing by which we put on the new man and walk in the conversation of that new man. You know what that is? That's called maturity. 
Amen. Now the brethren don't like it. They want you to think 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 is all you ever needed to know. Amen. Look how the first epistle of Paul ends. What are you being created for? What are you in Christ for? You are the means by which God is going to bruise Satan. The first member up there was Jesus Christ, the head. God been joining members to him, filling him up, building him up for 2,000 years. <clears throat> What's it for? To bruise Satan under our feet. Amen. You know what Paul does in Corinthians, Galatians? You know what he does? He instructs us as a father. Listen, man, that ain't positional right there either. Read the context. Mark them, which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that be such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And with good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has come abroad to all men, and therefore I am glad on your behalf. But I would have you, I would have you to be simple concerning that which is evil and wise concerning that which is good. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Amen. If what? If we do what he said. Mark, avoid. Be wise to what's good, simple to what's evil. You ever notice people don't ever have a problem knowing what to do with their time until it comes time to do something for God? Yeah. They, are, they are wise in everything they want to do except in what God wants them to do. Man, they don't know how to do a single thing that God has asked them to do. They are reprobate unto every good work. Yeah. Oh, I know. It's getting hard tonight. It's book. You start talking about the will of God. You start talking about, let's do something for God. And people just like, <laughs> bring up vacation. Glory. Yeah, man, Men don't have a problem finding a bar, a strip club, drugs. He's an absolutely skilled workman when it comes to evil. When it comes to good, he ain't got a clue. Amen. Amen. So what is God doing? What's Paul doing? Paul as a father is instructing us to bring us unto mature sons. So that we can walk in the conversation of the new man for the purpose that God has created us. When God, how, how many of y'all knew God called out an army in Exodus? Did y'all know that? Sent them out by their armies. That's Exodus, the end of Exodus chapter 12, going into chapter 13. Might be the end of chapter 13. In Numbers, in the book of Numbers, you know what he begins to do? He begins to number them. What's he numbering? He's numbering an army, right? And how old? You had to be, you had to be a certain age to go to war. God didn't send babies into war. He didn't send little kids into war. He sent men into war. Amen? Babies, Corinthians, little children, Galatians, be no more children, grow up into him in all things. Finally, my brethren, take unto yourselves the whole armor of God. So what are you being matured for? You're being matured for the struggle and the conflict against Satan. Amen. Now I know you like to think that you live in a good world, but you don't. You were birthed into a world of conflict, birthed into a world of rebellion that God is going to set in order. He's being long-suffering at this present time, but God will only let the iniquity and the rebellion go on for so long. And it's time you choose sides in the conflict. Quit straddling the fence. Get in the conversation of this world or get in the conversation of the new man. Amen. Somebody's coming in back there. 
No. Now, listen to me. What I'm talking about is maturity, maturity and growing up. And that is evident all around you. Amen? In the natural. If you want to know how God, I'm so sick of men creating these ways of knowing God and pretending to sit on God's throne and telling you how God does things when it's evident throughout his word and all around you. God always does things by process of maturity. Always. Always has, always will. Let the earth bring forth. You plant a seed in the ground, you water it, it dies, it roots, it grows, it comes under maturity, produces fruit, and then that fruit reproduces more. It's like that in the animal world. Seed goes into the woman, becomes an embryo, grows into a baby, comes forth. You put the baby on milk, it begins to grow. You start to give it meat, it matures into a man and reproduces. It's evident all around you in nature. Is the, is the spiritual things the same way? I don't know. You tell me, did God liken his word as milk and meat? Did Paul say, I planted and Apollos watered? That means the spiritual realm is no different than the physical realm. That's why God talks to you that way. You know, you know not only that, but what we learned at that museum down there is that God's word was that way. God has been, you see, this is what the scholars do. The scholars make up how we got the Bible. They make God's rules. Inspiration and translation. They make up the rules for God. You don't get to make up God's rules. Amen? It is so evident what we went through in that museum. It is so evident that God brought his word the same way. That the Hebrew language is where the seed come from. Abraham, circumcise yourself. We're grown ups here. Y'all know what the sperm of a man is? It's a seed. And that Hebrew language, <clears throat> Paul said that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the what? Greek. There it went. Yeah. Sure. Hebrew. Greek. You know, you know, you know what they, the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet are? You know what they are? Aleph, Bet. You know what the first two letters of the Greek alphabet are? Alpha, beta. You know what we call ours? Alpha, bet. There you go. Amen? People's like, oh, yeah. Do you know God said he was going to turn to man a pure language one day that they may with one consent serve him? Hebrew, Greek, Latin, English, you got it in its maturity. You've got it in its perfection. And you know how I know it's the Word of God? Because Satan ain't writing 200 Bibles in Spanish. Yep. Or Tagalog or Chinese or Japanese or anything else. And I've watched, I've watched YouTube and I sit over there and I, I watch these people from all over the world get on TV and talk English. But I tell you what the English language is also doing. You're either getting on the side with God or you're going back to Babylon. Because we went from English to Babylon, from Babylon to English, back to Babylon. God is going to judge Babylon one day. And it's coming. But you see how God gave his word? He gave it through maturity. Y'all understand that? The body of Christ is the same way. A head and its members. God, is, God, God took the head, placed it up there. There was baptism of these members into it. Those members are perfected through the word of God and through the perfecting of the individual member, the body of Christ is being edified, maturing. His temple the same way. 
He don't snap his fingers. He lays a foundation. He builds pillars. He furnishes it. He gives dimensions for how you build it. God does things in order. And so anybody who is against this doctrine of Paul's curriculum to birth, to grow you up and to instruct you under that new man is actively weakening the body of Christ. Oh, don't listen to them. You're, you're fine. You're complete. Don't worry about it. You ain't got to grow up. You know what they're doing? They're spoiling you. They're weakening you. And that's why every generation the church gets emptier and weaker and sicker. Say, so how we put this new man on, preacher? There's two books in that Bible. There's the old man, there's the new man. Notice the book of the generations of who? The book of the generation of who? You got that? You want to take a stab at this verse? Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy what? All my members were what? Which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Somebody's members were written in a book. You want to take a stab at a passage like that? Huh? Wonder what book it is. Wonder if it's this one right here. And he has members that were written in God's book. Yet being on what? You know, that, listen guys, that's going to help you understand why Paul said he gave prophets and apostles and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the edifying of what? Somebody's members are written in a book. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being what? There it is. And in thy book all my members were written. Guys, I hate to get all genetics and stuff like that on you. But you got a whole book in that Bible called Genesis, genes, genetics, seed, generations. You got a word in that Bible called, a word in that Bible called re generation Amen. that book goes into you and makes you a functional member of another man's body you see these members written in thy book does that verse make sense now you are the epistle of who? Christ. You are the epistle of the book. Where were his members written? Before they were ever formed? Before they were perfect? Before they ever came to be? They were written in God's book? And I get up here and say, you're a Corinthian. You're a Galatian. You're an Ephesian. You are the epistle. Right there they are, written in the book. And these, this book of the Lord Jesus Christ, you the epistle of Christ, ministered with the spirit of the living God written upon the fleshly tables of the heart makes you, you are the member of that body and you're written in that book as a member of that body. Yeah, it's deep stuff. But that's how you put on the new man. Guys, I'm so tired of people thinking they can have church without a book. How do you put on the new man? Right here. His members are written in this book. Amen? You are the epistle. You are the epistles of that book. 
Chosen in him when? How long has that book been settled in heaven? Forever. That'll make you, that ought to make you go home and say, I need to, I know this, 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 and this stuff's over my head, but I need to understand it. We are the book of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are his epistle. We are the living members of his body. Amen? Now watch this. The first man is of the what? The second man is the Lord from where? Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled where? Where did, the, where did the Lord come from? Where did the second man come from? What's forever settled up there? In heaven. Get it? In the beginning, God created the what? Look what's right at the very center of it. The AV. Oh, I don't believe that. Yeah, we didn't figure you would. <laughs> Problem with people is they don't think God can put a book like that together. You explain to me how the Word of God is forever settled in heaven and then he didn't put the AV. There's one Bible that claims to be the word of God, that bears the title AV in the world, and it's in heaven in the first verse of your Bible. Amen. The heaven is my throne. John went up there, and he saw a throne. You know what he saw in the right hand of the one who sat upon the throne? A book. So when we talk about the book, we're talking about that book right there. And that ain't it. Jesus Christ was the seed of David. That right there is right smack dab in the middle of David's name too. The AV was in David. And it's in saved and savior. You better get your head out of the clouds. And if you want to be truthful about it, when you wrote his name, when you wrote Paul's name back there in the old English, it was in the middle of his name too. And as Gary and them pointed out, the V in the old English looked like that. That's the symbol for gold. Amen? That's the gold standard of the Word of God. And when this book right here gets in you, when that book from heaven gets inside of your inner man, you know where your conversation is? Heaven. Got it? Because the Lord, the second man is the Lord from heaven. Where the word of God is forever settled in heaven. Right there, the AV. When you get that AV in you, your conversation is no longer in the earth. It's, your conversation is in heaven. Amen. And so now get this right here. How do you put the new man on? Right there he is. Right here's the clothing. You know, one of the things Gary pointed out at the museum, man, that I just loved was that Adam was the first book of God. And God gave him his word, breathed in his nostrils. He inspired him, gave him his word, said, don't eat. You'll live, eat, and you'll die. What happened to the first book of God? He died. And you know all that book was to man? All that Old Testament was, you know what it was? Ministry of what? Death. Death. There was no life in the book of God for you. Amen? And then the Lord Jesus Christ came. He went and died on a cross and rose again from the dead. And the first thing he did after he rose was come to his apostles and breathed on them. He's the second book of God. And that second book is plumb loaded with resurrection life of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The second man was made a quickening. The last Adam was made a what? You know what's in that book? The breath and life of the risen Son of Almighty God. And Paul comes over here in Ephesians. And you've got to understand the structure of Ephesians. We're going to get into this conflict for just a moment. But you've got to understand the structure of Ephesians. He first lays out doctrine and then prays for your enlightenment to that doctrine. That's step one. And you think, I mean, and guys, I say stuff like this, but I don't say stuff like this to be mean. I say stuff like this because it's the reality of the world. Finding Christians that even know why the body of Christ is being created, when it was chosen, to even know that they have their own special calling and election in Jesus Christ in the heavenly place, even finding a Christian that knows that stuff is rare. And right here it is. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will to the praise of the glory of His grace. Paul lays it all out there. Then he prays for your enlightened understanding of those things, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You can never begin to walk in the conversation of the new man in heaven until you're first enlightened to what Paul's talking about in Ephesians. Never going to happen. You can put on soup lines for the homeless. You can clothe the naked. You can go out and do a bunch of social things and make the community a better place and go out and paint graffiti, clean up trash on the highway. But your conversation's still on the earth. You're not taking on the conversation of the new man. Amen. Hollywood does all them things. Amen. Paul lays out the doctrine, prays for you to understand it. Chapter 2, he lays out time past and now. And it's, we're not talking dispensationally. He's talking about your time past as a dead sinner walking in the course of this world. He says, remember what you were in the past. How that you were dead, to, dead in sin. Walking according to the course of this world. Having your conversation in the lust of the flesh and the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature a child of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy. Paul says, Paul says in time past, you were dead in sin. You were in the conversation of the world. But now you've been quickened with Jesus Christ and raised and seated in heavenly places. He goes a step further with us Gentiles and says, remember in time past that you were the uncircumcision. Aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Stra or strange, I always get those back. Strangers from the commonwealth of Israel, aliens to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now, you are of the household of God. Made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ, reconciled in one body, to become one new man and his son. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Why is Paul laying that out? You were dead in sin in the course of this world. Now you're quickened and raised to sit in the heavenly places. You were a Gentile and a stranger and an alien. Now you're a fellow citizen and a part of God's house. Now he begins chapter 3 for this cause. For that cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now he lays out the mystery of Christ. And it's what? You Gentiles, 
who were dead and uncircumcised have been quickened and made a part of God's house in accordance to this mystery and the intention of that mystery. Amen. And its intent is heavenly. And therefore our conversation is to be heavenly. And that's why he now comes in chapter 4 as the prisoner and beseeches you to walk worthy of the vocation. How do you do it? You take on the conversation of the new man. Amen? And then he gets you ready for the struggle. Because when the new man starts walking in that heavenly conversation, he's going to be in the struggle with the princes of this world. Amen? What do y'all think about a world where that book is outlawed in the school, but books about sodomy can be read to seven-year-olds? And you Christians ain't got nothing better to do with your time. Go on and watch TV. As I promise you this, Satan and his course is operating. It's a sad thing that Satan's children will go out of their way to do his will and God's won't. Amen. You talk about the conversation of the new man. Well, I'm in Christ and I'm sealed and I don't have to do any of that. I'm, I'm already seed in heaven because all they're concerned about is their own backside. They don't care about God. They don't care about His Son. They don't care about the will of the Father. They want to hold hands with the children of the devil and then when the time comes, be like, well, y'all enjoy your time in hell. I'm going this way now. That's it. What fellowship hath light with darkness? Preacher, why are you so upset? Why are you so upset? <laughs> I'm not upset. I'm preaching. Yeah, by the way, that is a good point, Eric. <laughs> that is part of the conversation of the old man or the new man. Man. That's the conversation of the new man is to be angry Amen, and sin not. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So I guess you just have to deal with me getting a little upset sometimes. <laughs> I do get upset. I do get upset that people bought with the blood of God's son is not more zealous for the things of God. I get upset that people just come to church anytime they choose. I get upset that people come to church and then complain about how long they're there. I complain about People who come to church and don't want to sing songs because they're trying to hurry up and get out the doors. Do you know God inhabits the praises of His people? Sometimes you might have a better church service if you get together and rip out about three or four. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Now ransomed from sin and a new work begun. Amen. Rip them out. God inhabits those things. I just, I know I wasn't here for Sunday school and I just got here, but can we hurry this up? And I'll see you in a couple weeks. Yeah, I get agitated. I get irritated. Frustrated and everything else. That book you possess right there. You know the, the price that was paid for that book? When they wrote the Hebrew manuscripts, you know what they wrote them on? They wrote them on the skins of lambs. You know how many animals died so that the Word of God could be written? And then His saints come along. Men like William Tyndale 
who thought it was the most important thing in the world to get the Word of God in the hands of the boy pushing the plow and was burned at the stake for trying to get the Word of God into the hands of men. Men like John Rogers, Miles Coverdale. And then we take the book How many of God's saints were led as sheep to the slaughter? Paul bound with a chain, a prisoner for us Gentiles. I just want to do what he wants me to do. Now I'm not much. I'm not much. But I just want to take on that new conversation. I want to know that man more than anything I've ever known in this world. I want to know him. The book of God. The one who was in the beginning with the Father. The one who was manifested to us. The one who died and rose again from the dead. Breathed life into this book so that I could live unto God. I want to know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. And if He wants me to go wrestle, I'll go wrestle. Because I promise you there ain't anything else better to do. I'm going to have to find a spot to stop here in a second. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against all the wiles of the devil. Notice that. The new man stands against the wiles of the devil, meaning there is true enmity between the new man and the devil and his power. It's you and God's power against the devil and his power. Amen? Amen? God is empowering you with the life of His Son so that you can stand against them. He wants you engaged. And He promises you this. Listen, He don't educate you about the wiles. Paul doesn't sit there and give you a list of how the devil's going to come at you. Wiles is only in the Bible one other time and it's in the book of Numbers. And it's about the daughters of Moab and the Midianites coming in and corrupting the camp of God. Through mixing with the world. I know that's one of his wiles. Amen. Get the secular music into the church. Turn the women in the men and the men into women. And, and you'll understand that transgender stuff if we ever get to talking about the he and the she Bible here. Male and female is important to God. Very important. Amen? Yeah. Why, who did Satan go after? Amen? Yep. Very important to God. Noah Webster come around in the early 1800s and started making all the English words neutral. And within 200 years, we have a gender identity crisis in America. Amen? No more male and female just tear the whole structure down. And people's like, oh, it don't really matter. Yeah, it does. God created male and female. He does nothing without reason. Amen? Yeah. Hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Amen? We might get into some of that stuff here in the new future, here in the near future, but not tonight. What I want you to understand is that the wiles of the devil, Paul don't tell you about them. He just tells you to put on the whole armor of God and he'll be no match for you. Don't, God doesn't need you to be wise to evil. He don't. He don't need you to go and study all the tricks of the devil so that you know how to, how to go against him. God said, put my power in you and put on my armor 
and you'll have everything you need to stand against him. I don't know why in the world people will set this book to the side to go try to beat the devil in his own books. Christ never did it. Christ never did it. When Satan left out six or seven words out of Psalm 91, did Christ argue with him? Or you didn't quote that right? Uh, he just went to the book and said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He didn't get in a big discussion with him about the originals and all this other nonsense. Don't worry about the wiles of the devil. Be wise to what is good. Simple to what is evil. Put on God's armor and you'll be able to stand against all the wiles of the devil. Now notice what we do not wrestle against. <coughs> Flesh and blood. So what, do you, what does that mean? It means you can't fight this enemy the way you would fight a flesh and blood man. Now it doesn't mean that the enemy's not ever standing right in front of you. You just have to understand that the representation there, the image, is not the enemy. The enemy is the spirit that works in those children of disobedience. That's it. Amen? Those people have been educated in the course of this world since they were children. Amen? They're enslaved. They're in bondage. There are strongholds in their minds. And I tell you what, you, you say, oh, oh, preacher, how do we engage that? You need the weapons of God. The only weaponry sufficient to tear down those strongholds and cast down those imaginations and bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ is the weapons that God gave you. Not your debating tactics. Not how well you can argue. Not your points. It takes a mature man of God, skilled in the Word of God, to be able to engage in this warfare. And Paul's getting ready to tell you how to engage. But notice what you wrestle against, guys. It's scary. It's scary. You are wrestling against principalities and powers. Rulers of the darkness of this world, meaning they sit in high seats. They have great power. They govern the darkness of this world. Meaning every legislation, everything that gets passed into this world to drive the world further and further into darkness is passed by these rulers. They've been there for a long time. Amen. But we've got a head that's seated far above all of them. That's the power you need. Paul talks about your loins, your breast, and your feet. What does he tell you to gird your loins about with? What is our loins? Well, on a man, the loins run from about the bottom of this rib. The one verse talks about the navel down to the thighs. The loins ran from about here down to here. You, you, could, you could wear britches all the way down to your ankles, but it went from the navel down. This was the loins right here. But we're not talking about physical men, are we? We're talking about an inward man, a spiritual man. What is the loins of the inward man? Well, Peter tells you, gird up the loins of your mind. So what is the loins of the inward man? The loins of the inward man is the mind. And so what is the mind to be girt about with? What is it to be clothed with? Truth. Your mind is to be absolutely girded and clothed in the truth of God. So much so, man, that you can call it out that when you speak, you just breathe it. Men like Billy Elmquist. You can sit there and talk to him about a cup of coffee and he's going to throw 2 Kings 8 in there somewhere. Hey man, you ever been around? I mean, I've been around them saints. 
They breathe God into a place. <coughs> Amen. <laughs> Just gird about with the truth, man. Gary, Gary, Gary uh, Roverino out there at, at the Bible Museum, the second day we went to the museum, he got up to preach and he said, these guys here, man, we get a good testimony everywhere we go, boys. He said, these boys here, he said, he said they, they took a two-hour tour, sat in church all day, did a tour after church, and went home and sat up till two o'clock in the morning talking about the Bible. Amen. He said, that's all they do. They can handle this stuff. Our conversation is there. Right. Amen. I thank God for that testimony. We have Bible conferences here where we sit here from one o'clock till nine o'clock at night and then after the preaching's done, we sit over here at midnight, one o'clock in the morning talking about the Bible. What else is there? Amen. It's my life now. It's my life. Gird about with the truth. You ought to be able as you go out here and live your life, your inner man should be so clothed with the truth. You shouldn't be walking around in the darkness. Not knowing up from down. You ought to have the Word of God so enclosed in you that every day, just, just all day long, the, the Scriptures are governing your steps. I tell people all the time, one of the biggest parts with, of Christians, if you ask them who they are, who are you? Oh, I'm, I'm so and so. No, no, who are you? What does the Bible say you are? Give me that slow ball across the plate. Watch me hit it out of the park. Dead to sin, alive unto God, members of His body, temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the epistle of Christ. Ask me who I am. People walking around don't even know who they are. No truth in them. Your loins of your mind are to be girt about with the truth. Preacher, I can't remember Scripture. Well, then you better read more of it. Amen? I guarantee if you had cancer and it wasn't going away and they said you need more chemo, well, that chemo ain't working, well, that's because you need more of it. I guarantee you'd run and get it. And you say, I can't understand Scripture, so your answer for that is to read less? You've got to get that book in you. Amen. Amen. Our minds are to be clothed with God's truth, not man's philosophy. He tells us to take on the breastplate, having on the breastplate of righteousness. That breastplate of righteousness is called the breastplate of faith and love in 1 Thessalonians. Your heart is how that thing works right here. Here's the breastplate. Now we've dealt with the mind, now we're dealing with the heart, aren't we? How does that work? The Word of God must be received into the heart by what? And it must be put into practice in what? Love. That's righteousness. The Word of God believed into the heart and exercised outward in love is the breastplate of righteousness. Amen. You believe what God said and you put it into practice in love with the right motive. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. Charity out of what? And of a good conscience and a faith unfeigned. You know, you know, sometimes I'll be laying over there on the couch. You know what? I'll just start getting a heavy feeling in my, in my chest. You say, what is that? Bad conscience. You know what I do? I get up and I go read my Bible. I get up and do something for God. Call somebody, do something. Sit around idle. I get up and I do something. If it's read, study, get something ready for next week, call somebody. Email suit, do something. 
People don't even people, people have been taught in the gray circle that a good conscience just can be ignored. Yes, sir. You're not ever supposed to feel guilty. <laughs> Faith unfeigned, listen, charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and a faith unfeigned. That's the end of the commandment. Amen? Paul said, put on the breastplate of righteousness, meaning you need that to stand against the devil. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What does that mean? Well, it deals with your walk. Preparation means that your feet have been prepared to walk through the gospel of peace. He's not necessarily talking about going and preaching the gospel. As he said in Philippians, let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Meaning our walk and our conversation should be at peace with God. No, no longer walking at enmity with him, but our feet have been prepared to walk in accordance to that gospel of peace, fully reconciled to God the Father. And that gospel, listen, our feet designed to do two, th two, three things. Preach the gospel to others, walk in peace with each other, and walk in peace with God. It's peace. Peace with one another, peace with God, and taking peace to the lost world. That's it. I'm closing. Last verse. Guys, I know it's been all over the place. I can't help it. I hope you got something out of it. Take the helmet of salvation. Well, he told you about the shield of faith. I ain't got time to get into that one, but it is above all. This book is useless if you don't believe it. Amen? Every, everybody's got this book. Some people it's effectual with and some people it's not. You know how to believe that? If you know how to believe that book, you know how to quench everything the devil's going to sling your way. Maybe you're not really saved. Believe the book. Paul sitting down there in prison. Got you now. No, you don't. Amen. Nothing shall I be ashamed. No matter what he slings at you, faith in this book will quench it. Amen. Amen. Well, didn't you know about these manuscripts and whatever? I know about the book I got in my hand. The one I believe. The one that I love. The one that I study and preach. I don't know about all them manuscripts. Nor do I care. Thank you. Have a nice day. Now see, some of you people just, <clears throat> that dark comes in there and just, <clears throat> just crumble. <clears throat> Did you ever see this error here? Oh, maybe my Bible's not true. Mm -hmm. Let me call somebody out there. <laughs> You know what happens when I find something that I don't understand in that Bible? I just tell myself you're too stupid to understand it right now and I just keep going. It's all, I, it's all you can do. Amen? Because I promise you there ain't another one out there like it. Take the helmet of salvation. What is that? That's hope. Protector of the head. Amen? The helmet is the hope of salvation. You know what our hope is? Is that no matter what's going on in our life, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's going to be over. We look not at the things that are seen. That's our helmet. We look at the things that are not seen. I could be, listen man, I could be sitting on the street one day, getting beat to a pulp man, and just be sitting there going, any moment, any moment, Tell me somebody else has got that. A man can have, like Jeffrey Epstein, somebody like that, probably never faced much adversity, much discomfort in this world until they locked him up. But what hope did he ever have? No matter where you put me, they can't get my hope. 
Amen. They can't get it. This is temporary or light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We got to have that helmet. That helmet is our hope. And the sword of what? Spirit. You see that word there? Watch this. Right there. What is the sword of the Spirit? It's the Word of God. Sharper than any what? Two-edged sword. Gary showed me that the word sword is in the Bible 424 times. So is the word mouth. And when you take that 424 and put it like that right there, Right there is the two edges of the sword. Do you know how many letters are in the first verse of the Bible? 44. Do you know how many verses in the last verse of the Bible? 44. There's the two edges of the sword. First and last verse. But you want to see something even more impressive? Why did I say mouth? 424. Look at your tongue. Looks like a sword. When you get that book in your mouth, when you get that book in your heart, your tongue becomes the sword of the Spirit of God. If man knew how powerful that book was in him, if they knew what that book was doing in them and what power and authority it gave them in heaven and earth, they'd be in it more. Because right after Paul says this, Listen, man, I've watched it. I've watched this sword go to work on people. We had, we, I mean, I ran four of them off at the Bible Museum. That quick. Called two of them out. Because Gary locked the doors, two of them came to the doors trying to get in. And I said, look, man, they're dying to get in. They get in here five minutes, they'll be dying to get back out. <laughs> well, them two women, they actually were actually really coming to the museum. Somebody invited them. And the whole time I was sitting there preaching, I was sitting there, got up and left. I know people. I've watched that book cut, man. I've watched this sword. And the words of God. I'm not a storyteller. I'm a Bible preacher. And I've watched this book, man. I've watched this book. You can get up and tell mother, people. People like going to church, man, where it's just funny all day. Oh, that was such a good message. Oh, you get up, preach that book, man, they start. Mm, mm, as long as he's going to go, when's he going to shut up? I, I've watched that book cut deep. I've watched it. But it doesn't just give you power down here on the earth to speak with the words of God and divide and cut deep into the very spirit and soul of man. After Paul says this, he says, look at this colon. Praying Always, with all prayer and supplication in the what? You know, when you get that book in your mouth and in your heart, and you begin to pray with those words that are taught to you by the Holy Spirit, what power and authority it gives you in the heavenly realm. Where's your enemy at? He's over your head. Paul said praying Always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all what? I tell you what, when we go to England, you know what y'all need to be doing? Y'all need to be praying. Because right after this, Paul says, and for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to preach the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador set in bonds. Amen. Remember when he told the Philippians, I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. He said, you Philippians pray and I know that through your prayer, I'm going to be saved through the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Amen. You got 
See, people, people, people read for Ephesians. I'm, I'm going to close. People read this in Ephesians. They see six pieces of armor. Everything in Ephesians is in sevens. Everything. One body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who's above all through all and in you all. Seven things of the unity of the spirit. There are seven pieces of armor there. People rarely see that one. That's part of your conflict and warfare. Amen. One of the ways you actively stand against the devil is to be praying always with all prayer and supplication. When he says watching thereunto with all perseverance, you know what that means? It means you ought to be watching for things to pray for. Oh, that brother needs this. This brother needs that. You know what it does? It keeps you engaged. And I'm going to tell you right now, if a man has no hope of victory, he ain't going to fight. I watched the Americans go into Iraq in the Persian Gulf War back in the 90s. We landed there, man, and drove straight to Baghdad with thousands of them just waving white flags. They didn't want to fight because they had no hope of winning. You got to get your hope. You got to have that hope of salvation. Get that book in your heart by which you can engage the enemy with your tongue, not just here, but up there too. When you pray in the Spirit, you get power and authority in the heavens. God's Word has power and authority. Amen? And don't just pray for yourself. Pray for all saints that are engaged in the conflict. Amen, because it's real and the struggle's weird. I've watched these boys right here preaching Daytona with women coming up and grinding on them, knives being pulled on them. I've seen it. I've been out on the street preaching myself. People cuss you and yell Satan at you and everything else. The conflict's real. And because we're obedient to our Savior, the Son of God, the struggle gets more and more real. Amen. And there's many ways for you to engage in this conflict, guys. You don't have to be out there in the streets. But you can pray. You can give. Amen. You can read your Bible so that you know how to pray. Amen. Every member can be engaged in this conflict to some degree. All right. Sorry for going so long, guys, and getting so fired up. But, um, Lane closes out, man.